Bidenflation is changing people's lives. Fact check, it's Bidenflation, not Putinflation. Summer of Bidenflation means hardship. High prices for Americans. High prices are costing families $5,000 more this year. Everybody's talking about the current inflation crisis as being a product of Biden's administration, how it's his and the Democrats' greatest disaster, and how it's going to lead to their inevitable downfall in 2022 and 2024. Though I have a feeling that the Democrats aren't going to perform very well in the midterms. The 2024 presidential race remains to be seen. But nonetheless, the moniker of Bidenflation, like Obamacare before it, seems to have stuck. But how much of the inflation is actually Biden's, or more broadly the Democrats' fault? Let's check it out. Firstly, let's ask the question, how much inflation has there actually been? Well, the numbers in the USA, Canada, and Europe all point to around 5-6% to inflation in 2021 and 7-9% to inflation so far in 2022, with the historic average being 1-2%. to For example, in February, the inflation rate was 7.8, in March, 8.5, in April, 6.8, in May, 8.6, in June, 9.1, and for July, so far, we're estimated at around 8%. Let's take 8 as an easy number to work with. Dean Baker, from the left-leaning Center for Economic and Policy Research, says that 2% of inflation, approximately one quarter of that 8, was caused by Biden's American Rescue Plan, or the ARP, which the Republicans deride for printing about $2 trillion as stimulus to bail out pretty much everybody from the COVID crisis. Douglas Holtz Eakin, from the right-leaning American Action Forum, estimates that about 4% of inflation, approximately one half of that eight, was caused by the ARP. And this range between one quarter and one half is where most economists place their calculations. Michael Strain, from the libertarian-leaning American Enterprise Institute, guesses that the ARP caused about one third of inflation. Jason Furman, professor at Harvard, says that inflation in America is 4% higher, that's one half, than countries in Europe, which did not implement a comparable stimulus as the ARP. So it does indeed seem like the inflation was partially caused by the Biden administration's American Rescue Plan. And we can see this pretty starkly on an inflation graph. Inflation begins moving beyond the 2% upper limit in March 2021, which is the month that the ARP was passed, and continues to skyrocket with no end in sight. But inflation is not entirely caused by the ARP. Some people on the left say that inflation is caused by the war in Ukraine, and that Bidenflation is just rhetoric and cope from the Republicans. We can examine that claim too. In an article by Corrado Maccarelli, an associate professor at Brunel University, he estimates that the Russian invasion of Ukraine has led to an increase in oil prices by 30%, gas prices in Europe by 90%, and food prices by 17%, because Ukraine was a net exporter of grain and corn. The food price increase will also cause a price increase in biofuel down the line. Maccarelli ultimately estimates that the war in Ukraine will add about 2% to global inflation in 2022 and 1% in 2023. The Federal Reserve's own analysis comes to a lower number, 1.3%, but for the exact same reasons. So it may very well be the case that anywhere from one-fifth to one-fourth of that 8% inflation number we're seeing right now, 1.5 to 2%, could be caused by the war in Ukraine. The left also likes to blame the COVID supply chain crisis. We can check that claim out too, no problem. Here's a graph of global supply chain pressures. That first big hump is the initial 2020 lockdown, where no one knew what was going on. China was shutting down everything like crazy. World travel was being affected. Everyone was told to stop going into work and stay indoors. The second, larger hump happened at the same time as the inflation peak. So let's consider the possibility. Why would supply chain pressure cause inflation? This graph runs from 1960 to 2020, and it shows the individual consumption of durable goods, non-durable goods, and services. Non-durable goods are things that you buy and consume regularly, like food or gas. Stuff that you can't just make a one-time purchase of. Services are, well, when you pay the people to do stuff, that's obvious. Durable goods are things that you only need to buy once in a while. Cars, TVs, furniture, computers. These are big purchases that you might only need to buy once every 5, 10, or 15 years. What you should notice is that the durable goods purchases, the blue line, is significantly more volatile than the others. This makes sense, at least to me. During a depression or a recession, most people will put off those big permanent purchases, like cars or anything else, in order to prioritize non-durable goods, like food. And when things are going good, we can expect to see spikes in durable purchases for the same reason. Case in point, the 2008 recession. But once we add 2022's data to this graph, we notice that this current economic crisis is rather unique. We had the expected downturn around March of 2020, but by March of 2021, we had reached record highs, disproportionate highs, on spending of durable goods. In other words, people were spending more money than in any other point in history on big ticket items like cars and TVs and computers and whatever else. There was a huge shift in consumer preferences. 
Why? Part of that, again, we can lay at the feet of the ARP. If everyone's getting a fat stack deposit into the bank account, why not buy that new TV or whatever? Fair enough. But that's not the whole story. With people working from home, that's less Starbucks coffees grabbed on the way to work every day. That's less pre-made sandwiches for lunch. That's less restaurant visits. That's less $22 slices of avocado toast. And the incidental consumables market has been affected to the point that people who create that overpriced slop are beginning to complain. Even if we disregard the ARP stimulus, people's work habits have changed, which means that people's incidental spending has also changed. Less money spent on a lunch every day means more money in the bank available to spend, and that money is being spent on durable goods. In a way, back during the 2010s when the boomers were telling millennials to stop eating out and spending money on frivolous temporary treats and delicacies so that they could actually afford things like houses and cars, well, the boomers were right, except that a pandemic forced everyone to do it all at once, and we're now seeing the end result of that shift in behavior in the supply chain crunch. And one final side point. I don't think that one sideways boat that turned into a meme for a while had too big of an impact on the supply chain crunch, and therefore inflation. But you never know. The Suez Canal is pretty important after all. That reminds me, though. I've described where the supply chain pressure comes from, but not really why it causes inflation. When a supply chain experiences bottlenecks or droughts, goods aren't flowing at a steady pace anymore. This is called a shock. During a supply shock, prices go up because of a lack of availability. Demand remains the same, but supply goes down, causing the remaining supply to be more valuable. A great example of this is used car prices during the pandemic. Due to a scarcity of semiconductors suitable for use in new computerized cars, there was limited new car production. With less new cars rolling out, used car prices skyrocketed. During supply shocks that are widespread enough or strong enough, inflation goes up because prices of everything go up. But at the same time, growth slows. The companies producing the product ultimately have less capital to reinvest because they're not producing as much, so they're not selling as much, and so the amount that they can put back into the next production cycle is lower. It becomes a death spiral. However, during a demand shock, prices go up because of an increase in demand. Supply remains the same, but demand goes up. More people want to buy things. In terms of the relative scarcity of remaining supply, this is the same situation as a supply shock. The supply becomes more valuable. But there's another factor to consider beyond increased demand driving price increases. Unlike with the supply shock, growth doesn't slow down during a demand shock if the companies producing the products can keep production in line with the excess demand. If they can, then growth actually begins to accelerate. COVID lockdowns, paradoxically, created both a supply and a demand shock. Nobody was allowed to produce anything during the initial lockdowns. Supply was constrained, causing prices to rise for the now rare goods. Then immediately after, before the supply chain had a chance to readjust, after production resumed, demand massively exploded for those two reasons that I mentioned earlier, the ARP stimulus and the new spending habits promoted during lockdown living. And then to top it off, right after that, we got a second, smaller supply shock in the form of the war in Ukraine. This is why those estimates from earlier approximated the ARP as causing anywhere from 2% to 4% of the total 8% of American inflation. Reduced production during lockdown, different spending habits after lockdown, and the war in Ukraine have also all contributed. So for the sake of argument, let's give the anti-Biden people the best possible numbers. Let's assume Biden's stimulus actually caused 4%, half of the inflation. That leaves the other 4% to be divided among the war in Ukraine, lockdowns preventing production, new spending habits, and the normal 1% to 2% back background inflation. The question is then, what did Americans get out of the ARP? And was it worth 4% inflation? Well, on February 24th, 2022, Moody's Analytics published Global Fiscal Policy in the Pandemic, where they found that the ARP, one, grew the GDP by 5.7% in 2021, which is approximately 3% more than without any stimulus. Now, a lot of people say that GDP is a bunk stat because that tells you how well corpos are doing, not people, and fair enough. So let's move on. Two, increased health insurance enrollment by 4.2 million and kept 3.7 million children out of poverty. Though I think a lot of that second figure came from the expanded child tax credit, which was a side piece of legislation, not the ARP proper. Also, I understand that a lot of people are just ideologically opposed to the idea of a tax-funded safety net. And so, bringing more people onto health insurance isn't a positive for them. So let's move on to 3. Brought back 4 million jobs in 2021 and lowered unemployment by 2%. Without the ARP, employment was on track to rise back over 7% in the middle of 2021 and remain there. This is something that Republicans have to get behind, because jobs are their big thing. They can disregard the GDP for good reasons. They can disregard the social safety net stuff for meh reasons, but they can't disregard job growth. Now, Moody's report thinks that the ARP caused only 0.3% of the total inflation. That is wildly out of line with everybody else's calculations. And again, for the sake of argument, for strengthening the Republican side of the math, let's disregard that figure. To your average Republican voter who doesn't care about the GDP and who is pretty lukewarm on the idea of getting more people onto health insurance, 
was 4% inflation worth it to get 4 million jobs, 2% lowered unemployment, and the aversion of a second COVID recession? Are we better off with the inflation and those benefits than a world where we had 4% inflation instead of 8, and in return, unemployment was pegged at over 7%, there were 4 million fewer people working, and America was dealing with the Ukraine supply shock during an even worse economic crisis? I don't know about you, but I don't think so. That's not to say that print money provides stimulus is the answer to every single economic problem. Sri Lanka has proven that it's not. You can't just print and spend when your economy has no actual productive capacity. But there does seem to be an argument that responsibly, prudently, printing money in a limited, measured way operates like borrowing against future likely production, rather than simply devaluing your currency in the present. I already understand the argument that's coming out of the gold standard types in the comments right now. Your economy only has so much production, and your country has only so many dollars. If suddenly, your government like Venezuela or Sri Lanka just prints a whole bunch of money, they've increased the money supply without actually increasing increasing the productive capacity of their society. This results in each individual unit of money representing less of the total amount of production. Hence, prices go up and hence inflation. Sometimes when nations do this, they do it out of ignorance and end up stupidly destroying their economies with hyperinflation. However, we have seen socialist countries, most notably the Soviet Union, use inflation as a weapon. Hemingway wrote about how the Bolsheviks deliberately ruined the Russian ruble in order to impoverish money-holding people who did no actual labor. After the bourgeois was done away with, the now destroyed Russian ruble was replaced with the gold-backed Soviet ruble. The fact that money printing can be used as a weapon in this way is likely one of the reasons that libertarians often refer to Keynesians as communists. However, and this is what responsible governments try to do, let's assume that money is printed for a specific purpose. Let's assume that I am an unproductive citizen, but I have an idea for a new business. The government gives me a grant because my pitch sounds good. The government prints me the money to fund my business. Because money has been added to the supply without any change in productive capacity, this should cause inflation. But remember, I was unproductive before. Let's assume that my business is actually productive. I'm now working when I wasn't before. Maybe I create jobs and hire people. All of us are now producing when before we weren't. In this way, the government's measured, responsible printing of money has increased both the money supply and the productive capacity of the society. And with the ratio between the two remaining roughly equal, there's no inflation. That is what borrowing a against future likely production is. It's using printing money as a scalpel rather than, say, a chainsaw. A responsible government can estimate where injecting money into the system is likely to actually stimulate production in order to prevent or lessen inflation. And during a crisis like COVID, where in the first few months we really didn't know whether or not we were dealing with the cold or the black plague yet, an initial lockdown seemed necessary. And the ARP to restart production and borrow against the future production of a recovered economy also seemed necessary. So the final verdict, what caused inflation? Inflation. The best case answer for Republicans is, around 50% of the inflation was in fact caused by the Democrats passing the American Rescue Plan. However, that plan came with multiple economic benefits along with the inflation, and that not passing it while lessening inflation would ultimately have left the economy in a worse position. Inflation is still a serious problem that Biden needs to solve, obviously. But in an alternate universe, we probably would have been talking about the Biden economic crash instead of Bidenflation. And I don't know about you, but I think most people prefer living in this one.